Welcome to Goobertown Hobbies. My name is Brent. Today we're talking about real life and how it relates to our hobby. We're going to talk specifically about how Games Workshop is reacting to the times that we're living through. If you normally come to Goobertown to forget about real life for a little while, I totally understand if you want to go watch something else. Fun videos have an important role in maintaining our mental health. I get it. That being said, I'd really encourage you to stick around. We have a lot to talk about today, so grab yourself something to assemble or something to paint and settle in. For context, this is being recorded about two weeks after the killing of George Floyd by police, and about one week after Games Workshop released a strongly worded social media post, the one that closed with the words, you will not be missed. Other YouTube channels and podcasts and groups and blogs have been talking about this, and here's my take. Disclaimer, I'm speaking as myself in this video. My words don't necessarily reflect the views of any people or companies who've been associated with Goobertown Hobbies. We all have our own voice. It's up to each of us to decide whether to speak and what to speak about. Here's the post from Games Workshop. One of the great powers of our hobby is its ability to bring people together in common cause, to build bonds and friendships that cross divides. We believe in and support a community united by shared values of mutual kindness and respect. Our fantasy settings are grim and dark, but that is not a reflection of who we are or how we feel the real world should be. We will never accept nor condone any form of prejudice, hatred, or abuse in our company or in the Warhammer hobby. We will continue to diversify the cast of characters we portray through our miniatures, art, and storytelling, so everyone can find representation and heroes they can relate to. And if you feel the same way, wherever and whoever you are, we're glad you're part of the Warhammer community. If not, you will not be missed. Well, there is certainly a lot to talk about there. My intent in making this video is to persuade a few folks who don't already agree with me or at least get folks to think a bit differently about a few things. If someone gets angry at me, hits the thumbs down, and turns off the video, that accomplishes nothing for any of us. Actually, that's worse than nothing, because now there's another angry person out there wandering around the internet. Let's slow it down and see if we can start by finding common ground and just have a discussion. Even if you disagree with some of the things that I say, or you think I might be warming up to say something that you'll disagree with, Try to let the words in, and give them some real thought. For anyone with their cursor hovering over the dislike button, I'll tell you that I like some parts of this GW post, and I dislike other parts. What does that mean? Should I thumbs up this guy, or thumbs down this guy? Please relax that index finger. Stay a while, and listen. I basically agree with the first paragraph of this post. Warhammer brings people together across divides from all over to paint minis and roll dice. If you meet someone at a tournament, you have no idea who they voted for or what they do for a living or whether they went to college or, or whether they bother to call and visit their elderly relatives. At first, all you know about this person is they have an awesome technique of painting white scar space marines and they are absolutely dedicated to bringing land speeders back into the meta. Pretty soon, the two of you are going to have a shared experience of one of your lords doing incredibly well or incredibly poorly. Something memorable is going to happen in the game. You two might end up with some stupid inside joke about scout squads and be well on the way to becoming friends. Then you get to your next tournament pairing, and you think to yourself, wow, I don't normally hang out with guys who have face tattoos, but those Dark Eldar conversions are amazing. This guy is hilarious, and you have tons of stuff to talk about. A game store or a game club is an example of a third space. A place other than home or work where people can come together to build community. It's a place you can go to escape for a while. And if you feel that the Warhammer community is special for these reasons, then it's a valid criticism to say, how dare you inject politics or social issues into this special thing that we have going here. When I'm deciding whether or not to talk about real-life issues in my videos, this is the most important cost of that decision. For a lot of people, playing games or painting minis or watching videos is a way to escape, to relax, and to reset. And all that stuff is important to our well-being, and it has value. Now on the other side of that same coin, 
these gaming communities are places where you can actually find a liberal and a conservative hanging out with each other, talking to each other, and respecting at least some of the other person's opinions. Likewise, an awesome little community has grown up here around the Goobertown Hobbies YouTube channel. Some of you may know or think you know my political leanings, and you may disagree with them, but you and I have enough in common that we can hang out together. You respect my opinions just enough that you're interested in seeing where I'm going with all this and you're willing to hear me out. In the world today, that is such an incredibly rare thing. To have a group of folks who actually have different social and political views who are willing to hear each other out. And I think there are valid reasons to talk about real life issues in a gaming community. I'm choosing to talk about real stuff today because I think we're living in historic times and I think silence comes with its own price. I presume that this was some of the motivation for GW's press release. I also recognize arguments about other motivations for the GW press release, and we'll talk about those in a bit. Okay, next up, I want to talk about the last paragraph. And if you feel the same way, wherever and whoever you are, we're glad you're part of the Warhammer community. If not, you will not be missed. First thoughts? Wow, that's way more direct and confrontational than I expected. That sounds like an ultimatum. GW, you have my attention. Somebody at Games Workshop made a gutsy move to approve that final line. They knew there'd be blowback. And for the courage alone, bravo. Ready for this next bit? I think that line was a mistake. Now hear me out. Us humans are complex creatures. We're capable of amazing stuff. We can learn new information. We can notice things we hadn't paid attention to before. We can meet new people and make new friends. Our outlook on all kinds of different topics can evolve, and we can be persuaded of things. You won't be missed. That kind of shuts the door on the possibility of persuasion. With us or against us, decide now. Nobody likes having an ultimatum thrown in front of them. I suspect that last line alienated some folks who might otherwise have understood why GW chose to make that statement and the importance for all of us to recognize the nature of this moment that we're living in. George Floyd's death, his murder, was heartbreaking and enraging. And it's also an opportunity for change. It's gotten us to focus on issues that some of us just don't spend enough time thinking about. This moment is important because awareness of systemic racism is rising, and so is the political will to fix it. Something feels different about this moment different from all the other police killings in recent memory, and different from all the other protests of our generation. A big part of the reason why this feels different is because so many more people and companies and organizations are getting involved in one way or another. I'm glad that GW weighed in and made that post, but I also think that final line, kicking people out of the club, was a bad call. If you're trying to persuade someone to see your point of view, you've got to give them a bit of room to really think things through and see what it is that you see. I invite you to come with me on a little non-confrontational journey of the mind. Let's start with a hypothetical thought experiment. It's hypothetical and rhetorical, so please don't feel the need to type your answers in the comments section. There are no wrong answers, I just want you to give these scenarios some real honest thought. Alright. You're in your car, and you're driving to a Warhammer tournament or towns over. It's a long drive, but there's a really nice game store over there that puts on a great Saturday tournament. You were up until the wee hours painting your new HQ last night, you overslept, and you're worried about being late to the event. You're almost to the game store, and a cop flashes their lights behind you. Whoa, yeah, looking at the dashboard, you were definitely speeding. In that moment, as you're pulling over for a cop in a town that you don't know all that well, in that moment, would you rather have white skin or black skin? You put your car in park, your hands are on the wheel at 10 and 2. Knowing absolutely nothing about that officer getting out of their cruiser behind you, for the next 10 minutes, would you rather have black skin or white skin? Stop typing. Eyes closed. Let's continue that scenario a little bit further. The cop turns out to be polite and efficient. They still give you a ticket, but they send you on your way, and you arrive at the tourney just as the organizer is assigning pairings for the first game. A bunch of mostly white dudes make room for you, and watch as you breathlessly haul your army through the door. You're still pretty shaky with nerves and adrenaline. 
A traffic stop can be stressful for anyone. You say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm sorry I'm late, I got stopped by the police. In that moment, with everyone in the store looking at you, many of them strangers, would you rather have white skin or black skin? When you say, I got stopped by the police, are you able to play it off with a bit of humor in your voice? Does anyone in the room laugh? What exactly is it that they're laughing at? How does the reaction of the room change if you have white skin versus if you have black skin? What if you're Asian? Hispanic? How does that first impression affect the way that people treat you for the rest of the day? Let's say the TO lets you into the event, no problem. For the mind movie, let's say you have three opponents during the day, three strangers that you're meeting for the first time. Meeting new folks can be a bit awkward, especially if everyone involved is a bit of a nerd. Does your day go differently if you're a man than if you're a woman? What if you happen to be gay? You end up winning your second game really fast. Congratulations. You shake hands with your opponent, and you head over to the part of the shop where they sell merchandise. How closely are the staff watching you? Does anyone think that you might slip a few blister packs into your bag? Everyone in the store heard you say that you had a run-in with the police this morning, but how much of a threat are you to the inventory? Does that assessment change with skin color? How closely are people watching you shop? So I fully expect that we have different answers to some of these questions, especially since we come from all over the world. They're hypothetical and they're rhetorical. Do think about them, but please, please don't feel the need to argue about them in the comments. Social interactions, even simple ones, can be so incredibly complex. Sometimes a bit of role play helps us to think about things from different angles, be a bit more empathetic, and maybe understand the world just a tiny bit better. Myself, I'm a white male who plays Warhammer. Based on every game store I've ever been to, and from all the people I've met through YouTube, I feel pretty confident saying that most of the Warhammer community is white dudes. And there's nothing wrong with being a white dude. We didn't do anything wrong by being born white, and slavery is not the fault of anyone still alive today. Speaking as a white American, it's shockingly easy to go through life without giving the issues of race and racism very much thought at all. White folks don't have to worry about being discriminated against on a daily basis. Nobody calls the cops if I go for a walk or a jog through a certain neighborhood. And nobody calls the cops if I sit and wait for a friend at Starbucks before ordering. Nobody clutches their purse tighter if I sit next to them on the subway. If I get pulled over by the cops, I'm worried that they'll give me a ticket, but I'm not worried about making a wrong move and getting beaten or shot. Most days, I don't think about the fact that I'm white. Black people in America have a much harder time escaping their skin color. And this is a big reason why I'm glad that GW spoke out, and it's a reason why so many others in our hobby are speaking out too. Yes, it is nice to have a gaming community as a safe space to hang out and not think about the problems of the world. Why do we need to bring politics and social issues into here? Well, it's important because too often, people of color don't have the option of forgetting about this stuff and leaving it behind for a while. Racism follows some members of our community wherever they go. So does sexism, so does homophobia, and so does all the other bigotry that some of us are privileged enough not to have to worry about. The ability to fully relax and play games and forget about stuff for a while is a luxury that a lot of us take for granted. I think that white guys may be the only group who can truly leave their worries at the door when they enter a game club. For other groups of people, including people of color and women, hanging out at a game store still has more stressors than it should have. That fact should bother us, and we should care enough to be willing to look up from our game table and really, truly welcome others into our community. I used the word politics a moment ago, as in, why do you have to drag politics into things? Treating everyone with dignity and respect should not be political. It's basic human decency. We shouldn't have to say it, but apparently we do. We shouldn't have to say that black lives matter, but they do matter, and we do have to say it. Everyone going to a Warhammer tournament should be able to leave all their troubles at the door. Until that's a reality, it's okay to ask the rest of us to pitch in a bit. It's okay to ask the rest of us to care about the experience of people other than ourselves. Somebody in the comment section is probably typing about reverse racism. 
Just so we're 100% clear, racism is alive and well, and it isn't against white people. Every once in a while, we'll hear about a white person losing out on a spot at their preferred college, or maybe even a job as the result of an affirmative action policy. Those are exceptions that prove the rule. For white people, it's very rare that our skin color ever affects us in a negative way. And you really have to go looking to find examples of anti-white bias. Now it's true that we frequently hear statements along the lines of, I hate old white men. This anger isn't anti-white racism. It's a frustration at a system that was built to benefit white folks. It's a system that results in a massive wealth gap between white Americans and people of color. Black women are far more likely to die in childbirth than white women due to systemic racism in our healthcare system. Black families are far more likely to live near toxic waste dumps or have poisons in their water supply like in Flint, Michigan. And yes, black men are far more likely to end up in jail or die in police custody. Racism is still very much with us, in the big things and in the little things. As white people, we can choose to see it or we can choose to ignore it. I think we're at a moment where more and more of us are choosing to see what's there. It's making us angry, and we're ready to do something about it. There's a trope about old people being racist. To be fair to our grandparents, most of them were around when schools were still segregated. Black children went to black schools, white children went to white schools. Those schools were not equivalent. Most of our grandparents were around when black folks were expected to ride at the back of the bus, when it was considered okay to tell a black person to get up and move to the back of a bus. Most of our grandparents were around when civil rights leaders were being beaten and assassinated. We all learn from our parents and grandparents. Relative to a human lifespan, the civil rights movement of the 1960s was not very long ago. In the United States, literal slavery was not very long ago. Each of us is more like our parents than we want to admit. How many generations does it take to eradicate a mindset that justifies owning another human being? How many generations does it take to go from actual chattel slavery to treating other people with all of the fairness, dignity, and respect that they deserve? I like to think that it's mostly been true that each generation is a little better than the previous, but most generations are also pretty resistant to change. In the United States, there are still people who think that the Civil War was fought over states' rights. Well, sort of but it was the right to allow the institution of slavery that seemed to be the most important. All of the Confederate states were slave states. At the start of the war, the vice president of the Confederate States of America gave a speech about their new nation. Quote, Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests, upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. End quote. That crap is hard for me to speak aloud. Bragging about being the first nation in the history of the world to be built on the tenets of white supremacy? This is why celebrating any aspect of the Confederacy is so offensive. Just so we're 100% crystal clear. The Confederate leaders were traitors who fought against America and fought for slavery. None of them should be on statues glorifying them in any way whatsoever. A person of color driving to work or walking to school should not have to pass a statue of a man who was willing to kill hundreds of thousands of other Americans in the name of white supremacy. The Confederate flag is a symbol of hate. Don't anyone well actually me here. You know which flag I'm talking about and you know it's a symbol of hatred on par with the swastika. As wargamers, we can appreciate the tactics or the bravery of soldiers fighting for any army in history. If your great-great-great-grandfather fought with the Confederates, it's okay to be awestruck by his patriotism or his faith or his courage. But you need to also be clear that the cause of the Confederacy was monstrous. Slavery was the original sin of our country. America's past is horrifying. That stain takes a long time to wash out, and it also takes effort from all of us. The good news is that something does feel different about this moment. NASCAR just announced it would not allow the Confederate flag to be flown at its events. 
Towns are working towards the removal of statues of Confederate generals. There have been calls to rename streets and military bases. These are all little steps, but it seems like the time is finally right to take a whole bunch of these little steps all at once. I know a lot of my viewers aren't American, but there's plenty of racism in the world, and the basic message remains the same. Ignoring racism doesn't make it go away. It takes active involvement from all of us if we want to change the status quo. I said earlier that there's nothing wrong with being a white dude. Very true, but let's recognize that the system we're living in is racist. Simply doing nothing and, quote, not being racist is not enough. If you can recognize that you're part of a racist system that benefits you at the expense of others, and you're not doing anything to change it, can you really say that you're not a racist? Okay, I know somebody is typing, talking about racism doesn't do anything, stop virtue signaling, GW posting doesn't do anything, that's just a brand manipulating you. There is some merit to this viewpoint, but I'm happy to say that I think it's wrong this time. This time feels different. Black men have been killed by police in highly questionable circumstances over and over and over. Some have resulted in protests, but normally there's no accountability for the killers and the world moves on, fundamentally unchanged. A few years ago, Colin Kaepernick and others knelt for the national anthem at the start of NFL football games. They were kneeling and looking towards the flag while others stood and looked towards the flag. They took a knee in protest of police brutality and the unjust killings of black men in police custody. They were called unpatriotic. Kaepernick lost his job and was blackballed from the NFL. Kneeling isn't a sign of disrespect for the flag. People kneel to pray, and people kneel to be knighted by the king. This was a non-violent, respectful way of showing that they loved America, but something needed to change. They were called unpatriotic, they were blackballed, and nothing fundamentally changed. Well, a few days ago, the NFL apologized. Players are now allowed to kneel if they want to. That's a small step, but it's a step in the right direction. This time feels different, doesn't it? Protests have been going strong for weeks. People and companies are speaking out, and we're starting to see glimmers of major policy changes in states and cities around the world. We seem to be in a moment when real change is actually possible. This time, so many people are speaking that a critical mass has been reached and people with power are listening and acting. Momentum is building and building and building. This may be the opportunity of our generation to take a big step forward, or at least a whole lot of little steps. If this is our one real opportunity, it would be a sin to waste it just because we'd prefer to sit at home and read our new codex. Yes, it's popular to support Black Lives Matter. Yes, it's trending. People are speaking out because their friends are speaking out, and yes, companies are speaking out because their customers want them to. And this is all good stuff. This is momentum. Now, the spark for this wave of activism was the murder of a man named George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis. He was in handcuffs, on the pavement, and a knee was placed on his neck for more than eight minutes. During that time, George pled for his life, lost consciousness, and ultimately died. The video of the killing is disgusting and unambiguous. Members of the public were filming the police and begging them to check on George. Get off of him. Look, he's not moving. Check his pulse. He's not moving. Get off of him. Well, that knee remained on his neck for several minutes after George lost consciousness, and he died. We haven't seen the body cam footage from the four police officers yet, and we may never see it. But from the available footage, it appears that one officer committed murder while the other three watched it and kept members of the public from intervening. It was assault, it was police brutality, and it was murder. In America, police killings are far more common than they should be, and officers are rarely held accountable. But this time, the evidence is unambiguous, and there is massive public support to see that justice is carried out. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's from the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Regardless of any crime a person has committed, they have the right to a trial. In America, we're innocent until proven guilty, and everyone deserves the benefit of the doubt. That's as true for George Floyd as it is for the four officers. George Floyd never got a trial, 
but those four men have been fired, arrested, and charged for their crimes. In the coming months or years, they'll need to answer for what they did at trial. Too often, after a suspicious police killing, the officers are not held to account. But this time, things seem different. This murder was symbolic of the massive problems in our culture and in the policies that govern our police forces. There's an opportunity here to get people to think about things that are uncomfortable but important. Protests sprung up everywhere overnight. Individuals, organizations, companies, and YouTubers are all speaking up. Question the motives of any individual who speaks out all you want, but the chorus of the calls for change is deafening, and some of the right people are listening. Popular is good. Trending is good. This is momentum. And if that momentum keeps building, some systems will get fixed, some minds will change, and the future will be a bit happier. There's been outrage at police killings before, but it wasn't enough. The death of George Floyd was so horrible, so intentional, and so well documented that maybe, just maybe, this time our culture will take a few steps forward and this type of tragedy will happen less often in the future. At the protests against police brutality, more and more examples of police brutality are being documented. And that's fueling the protests and the movement to grow bigger and bigger. Yes, there are rioters, yes there are looters, and yes there are arsonists. The world is a complicated place and all those things are part of the grand truth. Part of the whole truth are also police attacking reporters, police attacking young women, and police attacking old men. Tear gas and rubber bullets have been used on protesters who are obviously peaceful. In Washington, D.C., one officer changed the grip on his shield so that he could slam the edge as hard as he could into the stomach of a cameraman. Then he tried to destroy the camera. These officers are committing assault in the name of, what, public safety? That little moment made me angry. For extra national embarrassment, though, that cameraman who was assaulted turned out to be part of an Australian news team. That officer is not what America represents. I think we all deserve the benefit of the doubt, and I do believe that most police officers are good people who do the best they can in a difficult and dangerous job. But some of the images of the way police have been interacting with protesters is really disturbing and eye-opening. Some of these officers are showing the world the brutality that people of color have been telling us about for generations. And yeah, there it is, right on camera. People in the United States have the First Amendment right to peaceably assemble to petition the government for redress of grievances. Of course looters should be arrested, as should arsonists. But nobody should ever be beaten by police. Ever. The use of tear gas and rubber bullets is unnecessary, and it shouldn't be acceptable to any of us. And, as you watch a few police cruisers burn, I have a question for you. What is the conversion rate between police cruisers and human lives? Think about your life, all your hopes and all your dreams, your past, your future, your family. How many 2015 Chevy police SUVs is your life worth? Keep in mind that your life is worth exactly the same number of police cars as George Floyd's life or anyone else's. Nobody should be murdered by police. I'm sorry cars and buildings got burned, but I am glad that the world is listening. Cars can be replaced. Human life can't. Something else you'll notice about these protests is that there are plenty of white folks marching alongside people of color. Mitt Squigging Romney was at a Black Lives Matter protest. The 2012 Republican nominee for president said Black Lives Matter. You're not going to find anyone whiter than Mitt Romney. People of color acting alone can't fix 400 years of structural racism that has benefited white folks. If they could, it would have been done already. It takes real, active involvement from everyone, including white folks, to make a change this big. But people of all races are paying attention, they are marching, they are speaking out. Progress is starting to show. The Confederate flag is banned at NASCAR racetracks. The NFL has apologized for their crackdown on players participating in peaceful protest. Several more police officers have been arrested and charged in the last week, all over the country, because people are paying attention. Some of these are from complaints actually being followed up on. Others are officers who've been seen beating protesters in the streets. Laws and policies are being changed regarding the use of force. 
There's a campaign called 8 Can't Wait, which advocates for eight separate police policy changes that have been statistically proven to reduce the rate of police killings. Stuff like banning chokeholds and strangleholds, requiring a warning before shooting, and exhausting all alternatives before shooting. Also, requiring other officers to intervene when they witness one of their own using excessive force. All of these reforms could be instituted immediately at the local level to start saving lives. The Minneapolis Town Council currently has the votes to literally disband the existing police department, clean house, and start over. Who knows if they'll actually go through with it, but that's a pretty strong negotiating position to get some changes made. Interesting questions are coming up at town council meetings, like why have we cut the budget for our town school, but not the police department? Which of these institutions actually prevents crime? Which contributes more to long-term public safety, our school or our police department? Fair question. That seems like something we should have asked before now, but better late than never. Here's another question. If there's a traffic accident, does dispatch really need to send officers with guns? What about a 911 call for somebody's friend that's been depressed and has a bottle of pills? What about a call for a homeless man sleeping on your porch? What about a noise complaint from a neighbor? Do those situations all require officers with guns? If there's a group of protesters with signs, do we need to send tactical squads to confront them? Maybe there are better strategies to de-escalate things. What if next year we hired fewer police officers and more mental health professionals and social workers? There are really creative ideas out there to increase public safety and reduce incidents of police violence. And the more you think about them, some of them make a lot of sense. Of course, we're only starting to see glimmers of change, and there is massive, massive opposition. Protesters are now being met with officers who don't display their name badges or even what department they're from. It's pretty hard to hold nameless officers accountable for violence against protesters. Police unions are rearing up and ready to fight. There are always those who fight for the status quo, even when the status quo is so obviously broken. Despite the opposition, it still seems like we have a massive opportunity here. Throughout all of this, I've been worried about the coronavirus at these demonstrations, but even with that, it almost seems worth the risk. Our generation might not get another opportunity this good. For whatever reason, the moment is right. We can't waste this. All right, back to that Games Workshop post. If you were one of those people who got upset at that post and you're still watching this, I'd like to try to change your mind. The first paragraph talks about how great the Warhammer community can be. Cool. The final paragraph tells the haters that they won't be missed. It stands to reason that the meat of the statement is in the middle paragraph. Let's see here. Our fantasy settings are grim and dark but that's not a reflection of who we are or how we feel the real world should be. We will never accept nor condone any form of prejudice, hatred, or abuse in our company or in the Warhammer hobby. We will continue to diversify the cast of characters we portray through miniatures, art, and storytelling so everyone can find representation and heroes they can relate to. Okay, let's see what specific items a person might be against. Prejudice, hatred, and abuse are bad. Hopefully, we're all on board with that, right? We will continue to diversify our cast of characters. Personally, I'm always for more minis. Something I'm actually really looking forward to is new Imperial Guard models. They showed up at the start of the 9th edition 40k trailer video, and for just a second, I got really excited. But no, IG in the 9th edition starter box was too good to be true. Now the Imperial Guard are supposed to be drafted from all of humanity across the galaxy. Men and women of all shapes, sizes, and colors. Currently, the aging Cadian Shock Troop kit are the best official Imperial Guard models. They're all dudes, and the facial sculpts look pretty white. I'd love to see a brand new kit, but I'd settle for an extra sprue of heads stuck in that box. A female head on those trooper torsos wouldn't look quite right, but it'd still be cool. Now I've seen some folks on the internet argue that if GW put more diverse heads in each box, they'd have to charge more money. <laughs> in my lifetime, those exact same Cadian troops have literally quadrupled in price. They started at $1 a model, and now they're at $4 a model. We all know that the contents of those boxes has very little to do with the price tag on them. So yeah, I'd really like some better head bits now, please. 
Whether it's in the name of real-life causes or not, I love having a variety of models to paint. I've mentioned before that the Lady Sequitur with the undercut is one of my all-time favorite models. They totally should have made female Stormcast Eternals from day one. Better late than never. I think GW is sincere in saying that they're working on diversifying the range, and I just want them to work faster. Next up, here's the bit from the whole press release that I think might have upset the most people. So everyone can find representation and heroes they can relate to. This seemed to get a lot of hate. The term SJW was used a lot, plus a lot of other lingo that I'm not really up on. Anyway, here's my take. As a white guy, it's easy for me to find models of white guys holding swords and casting spells and wearing power armor. Duncan and Darren and Peachy and Wade and Ben and James Workshop himself all invite me to come paint and play Warhammer. It's abundantly clear that white dudes are welcome in the hobby. It's been less clear that other people are welcome. Games Workshop is represented by real people and by fictional people. When Peachy was hired by Games Workshop, I imagine that the stack of resumes was quite white and quite male. But Games Workshop can signal inclusiveness using fictional characters too. Female models have been sorely lacking from the GW line until the last few years, but now they're being made and they are awesome. There was some uproar about a black ultramarine on the cover of a new book. Good, it's about time. Not sure why there hadn't been a black ultramarine yet, but better late than never. And yes, I said that Games Workshop was signaling inclusivity. This is a good thing. Come on into the shop. We don't bite, and this Warhammer stuff is pretty fun. And it's for you. Want to try painting the Space Marine? I don't have the experience of being anything other than a white male. But on those social media posts from GW, you can see responses from folks who are obviously ecstatic to be explicitly included in this awesome thing that is Warhammer. Of course GW has some financial motivation here, but I want them to have more customers just as much as they do. More people in the hobby supports more local game stores. It's more people to play with. It's more releases, more armies, more models, and new Imperial Guard kits with more options for customization. Time for a quote. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's from the Declaration of Independence. Even if you're not American, those sentiments probably sound pretty good. Personally, I wish that sentence in the Declaration of Independence explicitly said that all men and women are created equal or perhaps all people are created equal. But the rest is quite beautiful. Even British folks can probably see the appeal. And now I've got a definition here from the Oxford Reference Library that I'd like to read. The objective of creating a fair and equal society in which every individual matters, their rights are recognized and protected, and decisions are made in ways that are fair and honest. That sounds pretty good to me pretty much in line with all people being created equal with certain unalienable rights. Again, that definition, the objective of creating a fair and equal society in which each individual matters, their rights are recognized and protected, and decisions are made in ways that are fair and honest. That's the definition of social justice. I know the term social justice warrior invokes strong images. Relax, we'll talk about that but because of the way SJW is used on the internet these days, I figured there might be some misconceptions about what social justice actually is. Social justice, the objective of creating a fair and equal society in which each individual matters, their rights are recognized and protected, and decisions are made in ways that are fair and honest. Hot take, social justice is a good thing. Social justice is pretty much a catch-all term for all of the best ideals that are enumerated in the founding documents of America. My understanding is that most Western democracies value the principles of social justice. Of course, on the internet, the term social justice is commonly used in the context of social justice warriors, those people who care too much about social justice. Look, as complicated as people are, and as complicated as the world is, for some issues there's just a big, straightforward tug of rope between two sides. For issues of bigotry, on one side of that rope you've got Westboro Baptist Church, the KKK, literal Nazis, 
and idiots with tiki torches putting their backs into it and trying to make the world a more hateful place. On the other side of that rope, you've got social justice warriors anchoring the team for the good guys. They're pulling as hard as they can to fix hundreds of years of racial prejudice, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, and all the rest. I'm damn glad that there are activists fighting so hard for social justice. And if they want me to put pronouns on my name tag when I go to a convention, well, I'll be happy to do it. In that tug-of-rope metaphor, most of us have one hand on the rope, but we're just kind of standing there, looking around, and just happy to be outside. We're not racist, but... But a lack of action supports the status quo. And the status quo is built on systemic racism. The status quo is not good enough. Now is the moment for us to actually pull. Racist institutions are not okay. Police brutality is not okay. Wake up, put another hand on that rope, and plant your feet. Somehow, George gave us a real opportunity for progress. Don't waste it. Righto, back to the GW press release. I appreciate their blunt statement of support and being on the right side of history. I love the courage of the you will not be missed line, but I wonder if you will not be missed is alienating more people than actually disagree with anything in that statement. I think that final line also allowed a subset of YouTubers and bloggers to rile some people up and convince them they were against that post when they otherwise wouldn't really disagree with anything in there. I scoured the internet looking for the people who were upset by the GW press release. I found them. I found more of them than I wanted to. It was not pleasant. For a day or so, I was morbidly fascinated by this subculture of angry, intolerant Warhammer fans that I found. But then I turned back towards the light to report to you my findings. I found a couple of YouTube channels in particular who were working overtime to try to convince folk that the GW post was a declaration of war and that they and all their viewers should be against it. A strange cause to dedicate yourself to, but let's talk about that. There are a couple of decently big Warhammer YouTubers who seem to do little other than breed hatred. I'm not going to call them out by name because these guys love nothing more than flinging poop across the internet. Meanwhile, I've got real stuff to do over here. Anyway, I want everyone to think about the channels that you watch. Do they have anything useful to say? Do they put effort into their content? What emotions do they bring out of you? Do they have a positive impact on the hobby? If they were to disappear from your feed, would they actually be missed? The type of channel that I'm talking about here are supposedly lore channels or general Warhammer commentary channels. This means they don't assemble bottles or paint anything. They don't play and record any games. They pretty much just display images or video assets created by others on the screen while they talk. Sometimes they might change it up by flipping through a book or mousing around an internet browser. Supposedly they talk about lore but they actually spend most of their time complaining about how SJWs are ruining the world, or something. None of these so-called lore channels seem to recognize the phrase, you will not be missed. This phrase is the final line that gets printed on the first page of every Warhammer 40k rulebook. So I'm not sure if these guys actually know much about Warhammer lore either. These YouTubers read the post from Games Workshop, and immediately self-identified as the toxic garbage that GW doesn't need associated with the hobby. These guys read a social media post that stood against prejudice, hatred, and abuse, and immediately took umbrage. GW, why are you picking on me? Better question, why, why, why would you instinctively identify the qualities of prejudice, hatred, and abuse with yourself? Now, I think they're right. I think GW was talking about them, but how twisted and pathetic do you have to be to put yourself on the wrong side of basic human decency? As far as I can tell, these creators, who don't actually create much of anything, thrive on hatred. They cultivate outrage to bait clicks for their lazy content. They do a lot of backwards, ignorant ranting about how social justice is somehow a bad thing, or about how this group of people is destroying the world, or that group of people is destroying the world. And of course, Throughout their content are casual slurs towards everyone from lesbians to people with mental handicaps. Words that aren't used in public because of how rude and damaging and uncalled for they are. I'm not sure if the casual insults to groups of fellow humans are done because they think it's funny or what. Hate and ignorance are at the heart of everything we're talking about today. 
Anger at injustice is one thing, but blind, dumb hatred is one of the most destructive forces there is. Hate makes us worse as individuals, and it makes us worse as a community. Every once in a while, one of these hateful YouTubers with nothing of value to contribute will try to justify their toxicity. It's just for fun. They're just hanging out and making jokes. It's not funny. You're an adult, and you're in public. I've also heard, I don't care what you think, this video is going to get lots of clicks and I'm going to make money. Wow, that's even worse. I know how much money a click on YouTube is worth, and these guys are selling their integrity and their dignity very cheaply. The world is an uncertain place. The only thing we really control is the way that we treat others. Why would you ever, ever sell that? Now you have nothing left. Who knows what other excuses these guys have for spreading hate. At the end of the day, there is no excuse. Sometimes the simplest explanation is the correct one. Some of these guys are just racist, sexist a-holes. Sometimes one of them will turn on their webcam and we'll get a glimpse of the, uh, master race. Don't worry, these guys aren't superior to anyone. If YouTube ends up recommending your videos, people think that you know what you're talking about or that you have some expertise in something. Myself, I think that comes with a degree of responsibility. I want to give my audience something of value, tutorials, original footage, thoughtful commentary, or just an overall feeling of inspiration and positivity. Mousing around the GW web store while spreading hatred is not valuable content, and it makes our community worse. Anyway, I didn't call out any channel by name, but some of these guys know that I'm talking to them. They heard me talk about lazy, hateful, ignorant channels with nothing of value, and they knew I was talking about them. Pretty sad, huh? By the way, some of these channels have been around for a long time, and they haven't always been so toxic. I used to watch some of them myself before they really took a turn. So if any of these guys are still on your list of subscriptions, hey, I get it. People change, though. Take a look at what those guys have become. The good news is that people can change for the better, too. As viewers, we can decide how we spend our time. We don't have to spend it watching hateful little trolls. Now, if you're watching this video and you're seeing really hateful, awful stuff in the comment section, don't respond. Just downvote and report. All of the deplorable comments will collect at the bottom, and they will be deleted, and they will not be missed. Make the choice to go through life happier than those guys. Assume the best of people and not the worst. Let's lower our blood pressure a little and be better to each other. Now, in all this, the paradox of tolerance pokes its head up. In trying to live a good life, being tolerant and friendly to folks different from us is a beautiful ideal. And if we try, we can get pretty close to it. And trust me, it's good. Good for making friends and good for your state of well-being. But you can't quite tolerate everyone. Sometimes you need to put some anti-fascists on boats to go across the Atlantic and stop Adolf Hitler. Sometimes you need some anti-fascists to hold up signs in the street to protest police brutality. And sometimes you need to tell some trolls on the internet to go get some fresh air, have a glass of milk, take a nap, and come back when they're less grumpy and they're ready to behave like an adult. I don't tolerate Nazis, and I don't tolerate guys who own tiki torches for all the wrong reasons. As the saying goes, in order to maintain a tolerant society, the society must be intolerant of intolerance. And thus, the paradox of tolerance. Just another way of saying that we should be good to each other, but Nazis ruin everything, and they're the literal worst. One more thing. If you play a game against someone who has a swastika painted on anything other than a World War II German, or they have a Confederate flag on anything other than an actual Confederate army, it's okay to gently tell them that this isn't alright, and that they should repaint it when they get a chance. If someone in the game store or in your basement is using casual slurs in conversation, you can ask them politely to stop. Most people will have the decency to feel a little shame, make a little adjustment to their behavior, and they'll be a better opponent for you and everyone else in the future. Since a decent number of folks watch this channel, I figure that I have a duty to emphasize that hate speech is never okay. If we see someone spewing hate, let's just all recognize that it's not cool. It doesn't make any of us better, smarter, or happier. If anyone types a rambling, angry response about what Brent really means is, or what people like Brent really want is, 
Well, I think I was pretty clear and honest with my views in this video. Any troll putting words in my mouth is wrong and can safely be ignored. And viewers, I'm sorry you had to see me like this. I don't like to spend my time angry, but digging into this subject required that I research some dark corners of the internet. When I make videos, I put effort into them, and sometimes that includes doing research. Gah, see, I'm doing it again. Gotta calm down and get back to that goober town spirit. Anyway, in all this, the thing that really upsets me is that some 12-year-old kid is gonna search for Warhammer videos, and YouTube is gonna recommend one of these hate buffets. These channels are awful ambassadors for the Warhammer community. There's not much we can really do about this, but when that same kid wanders into you or me, let's show them what this hobby is really all about. Okay, bringing it back here. Almost everybody does belong in the Warhammer community. Think about it. You love Warhammer, you're not a bigot, and you'll play a game with anybody at least once. Plus we all really do want those Imperial Guard models with tons of variety and tons of options for customization. After this episode, I'm going to return to the regularly scheduled Goobertown Hobbies videos. At our core, Goobertown Hobbies is a fun place for painting toys, and absolutely everyone is welcome to enjoy it. I gave a good think about whether or not to make this video. I realized that game clubs and Warhammer groups can feel like a warm shelter away from real life. When members of our community speak out about real-life social issues, I understand that it can feel like they're breaking a covenant. Whoa, whoa, I thought we agreed no politics at the game table. Again, this isn't politics. This is about treating everybody with dignity and respect. This is making sure that our community and our society and our systems protect all of us and give us all the benefit of the doubt. And along with that, we're going to grow the hobby, and we're going to get some cool new models. Of course, the other cost of making this video is attracting the attention of hateful trolls. Hate is a choice, and I'd encourage you goobers to try a higher road and see if you like it. If you realize that you're already partway down that path of hate, remember you can always come back. And I'm serious about that. We all deserve opportunities. The opportunity to change and grow and be better than we were should always be there for us. In the end, Silence on these issues wasn't an option for me. With this platform, I have the chance and maybe the obligation to reach more people than I possibly could in my private life. I've been really impressed with the way that some other creators have handled this topic. The passion and love and courage of everyone who's spoken out on the side of tolerance is inspiring. The majority of folks were happy to see that post from GW, and so was I. For some people, it was clear that this post from their favorite game company absolutely made their day. If you're here for fun, and you want everyone else to be able to enjoy it just as much, then Warhammer is absolutely for you. On the real-life side of things, Black Lives Matter is trending. It's popular. People are saying it because their friends are saying it. Companies are saying it because their customers are saying it. It's called momentum, and it's a very good thing. Can you feel it? This feels different. We are so close. Change is gonna happen if we all get involved and tell our leaders and tell the world that business as usual is not good enough. There are structural problems that need fixing, and now is the time to change some stuff up. Pay attention. This is a defining moment for our generation. Don't let it slip by. If you choose to stay on the sidelines, you may regret it when the time comes to tell your grandchildren about what happened in the 20s. I'm just one voice in all of this. As a white guy, in some ways, I have the least relevant viewpoint and the least connected viewpoint. I think it's literally true that I personally have never experienced discrimination. I actually can't think of a single situation in my life where I felt that I was treated as less than because of the way I was born. I've probably said plenty of stuff that sounded naive in this video. That's a common side effect of white privilege but I'm doing my best to listen, to educate myself, and to make sure that I'm not part of the problem. We're all capable of learning and becoming better. One of the best things we can do right now is pay attention to the experiences of others, and try to piece all those stories into our understanding of this complex and imperfect world that we live in. We should also be getting tuned into those folks who actually understand activism, who can teach us about how to make the most of this moment. Get involved. Listen learn. Be heard and stay safe out there. Be compassionate and be peaceful, 
but demand better. Say it with me. Police brutality is not okay, and it does nothing to keep any of us safe. Say it with me. Hatred is not okay. Say it with me. Black Lives Matter.